Well, then you don't know about grace. Because there's no buts in grace. Grace is the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, I don't even like to call it the gospel of grace. It's just the gospel. It's just that's what the gospel is. And to just say, well, it's a gospel of grace. Yes, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ is by grace. And, and that's true. But just to say, well, it's a gospel of grace, meaning that there's a gospel of something else. No, it's, there's, there's only one gospel. Amen. And then also there's, a, there's a, 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 a book, and a lot of people like these little mini books, uh, Discover True Love. And um, this is talking about the, tr- the, the, the unconditional love of God. And then Grace um, and Faith Thoughts is a book my wife and I put together. Uh, just short little chapters about uh, grace and faith, how those things work together. Amen? And then also there's some CDs at the back there, uh, audio uh, recordings uh, of teaching series that I've done. This is one tomorrow. Who's going to be here tomorrow? Let me see. If, you, <clears throat> if you're not going to be here tomorrow, then you need to grab one of these because I'm going to be talking about the unfairness of the gospel. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah, I can't you know, see you guys look at me like that. that that's it. And, and, you know, I know it's a play on words, but uh, it's actually a very uh, valuable revelation for us all to get and understand that the gospel is not about fairness. If fairness is what you want, go to hell. Yeah, if, fair, <clears throat> if fairness and justice is what you want God to do and deal with you with, then go to hell. Because in all fairness, you should be in hell. Amen. See, it's not about that. It's about the love of the Father. That's what the gospel is all about. Amen. And so I think that so many people really get uh, uh, messed up in, in uh, confusing the issue. When, we, when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, what I'd like to do is I would like to talk uh, to you in these sessions that we're going to be together. I want to speak to you about uh, the, the peace of God. The peace of God. The peace, I, I would say, if I would entitle this, I would entitle it the peace of God and the kingdom of God. So the peace of God and the kingdom. And uh, turn with me in your Bibles here to Romans chapter 1 and verse 11. Romans chapter 1, verse 11. Uh, Now, what I want to do in this particular passage of Scripture is I want to use this just as an an introduction to this teaching um, and, and really explain to you, and I believe that this passage of Scripture explains uh, really what my heart is in, in the ministry that I have uh, ministering all over the world. Uh, you know, 20, uh, I'd say 28 years, 29 years ago, when my wife Kathy and I uh, ventured out of pastoring and started ministering uh, as, uh, here in America they call you an evangelist just because you travel. Um, you know, an evangelist really, for me, it's like I took me a long time here in America where people said, well, you're an evangelist. I said, no, I'm not an evangelist. Yes, you are. You travel all over the world and you minister. And so you're an evangelist. No, I'm not. An evangelist is somebody who goes out into the field and, 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 and preaches big crusades and gets people saved and brings people to the Lord. Uh, that's not what I do. I'm a teacher. I teach mostly to the body of Christ. And so uh, when we left pastoring and went into an itinerant ministry, teaching and ministering in conferences and churches and that kind of thing, um, this is the passage of Scripture that really uh, 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 was the foundation of our ministry. And if, so Romans chapter 1 verse 11 says, Paul says, For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. Now, you know, th- th- this passage of Scripture, when he says, uh, you know, uh, I long to see you that I may impart unto you a spiritual gift, that, that term spiritual gift is, is a, a charis gift, a, a, a grace gift, a favorable gift. 
And so really that is what I want to do here uh, this morning in this time that we're going to be together is to be able to impart unto you not a bunch of information, but I want to, I want to impart unto you a favorable grace gift so that you may be established. You know, so many believers in the body of Christ go through their whole life in church and never get established. And, you know, Pastor and I were just talking about this last night. And, and, and I mean, the, 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 the true reality is, is that there are just so many fruitcakes in, in the body of Christ. Just people that are just nutto. Amen. It's like, and it's like they have, I mean, one minute they're there, the next minute they're over here, the one minute they're down, the next minute they're up. They, they, they're not established. And really, I believe that, that it is so important for us to be established, you know, especially in the day that we live in. I see so many believers that are just so tormented by the fear of what this world brings. The, the, listen, let me just say this. We live in a dangerous world. We live in an evil world. Evil is real in this world. But, you know, when it comes to us as believers, we should, of all people, we should be men and women who are at least stable in an unstable world. <laughs> I don't know if you, you understand that and, and, and really get that. The, the truth, though, is, is that most people in the world cannot ever really rely on most believers because the believers are even more unstable than they are. It ought not to be that way. But unfortunately, that's how it is. And so we have a lot of people that look at us as believers and say, I have enough trouble. I don't still need to add what you have. Come on now. Now, I know that none of that's true about anybody in this place. I understand. This is, you know, this is for somebody else, but not for us, right? It's amazing how that we sometimes listen to things, and we don't listen to it as for us. We listen to it, oh, yeah, you know, brother so-and-so, he should be here right now. Amen. No, the Lord's going to speak to you. <laughs> Amen. So Psalm, go with me to, to, to the book of Psalm, chapter 34 and verses uh, 12 uh, through 14. Let me just... Um, read this here. This is where David says, he said, David says, what is, uh, what man is he who desires life and longs for many days? Anybody here? I mean, th th this is what he's saying. He says, what man is there that is not longing for many days to live long that he may see good? Anybody here want to live long and see good, right? He said, now, now, now notice what he does. He gives us some really practical things. He says, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil. Do good. Now, these are all, this is all great advice for us all in this world. If you want to live long and if you want to enjoy life and see many days, then, you know, keep your tongue from evil, your lips from speaking deceit, depart from evil, do good. Then he says, seek, inquire for, and crave peace, and pursue, go after it. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. I mean, you, he, he says, you know, you know don't, don't speak evil, don't do this. But then he says this, seek for, inquire. The Amplified says, inquire for, crave for peace, pursue and go after it. See, the peace of God, now this is what I want to talk Now, I do believe that we can look at it and say, we need to look and, and seek for peace in our relationships and, and in our communities and, and you know, at your, at your workplace. All, that's true, but I want to speak to you today about the peace of God. You see, the peace of God is, is a vital necessity 
for you and I to live a healthy, wholesome, and productive life. It's, it's a vital necessity. If you don't have peace, you are not going to be able to live a wholesome, healthy, productive life. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm always tempted to say Christian life. But life, not just your Christian life, life as, as a whole, you have to be able to live in the realm of God's peace. Now, therefore, I find that in the Bible... It instructs us, like David here says, that we need to inquire for, crave after. And the word that is used by David here is the word shalom. Shalom. When he says, you know, <clears throat> the, the carnal mind and the carnal world that we live in has the idea that when we talk about peace, uh, most people's idea of peace is nirvana. Uh, if you could, if you could, if you could get yourself to a place where you can seclude yourself in a very, very nice uh, atmosphere, find a rock somewhere where you can get into the lotus position. That's if you still can even do such a thing. Amen. <laughs> and 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 you know, cup your hands and start to to hum a mantra, and somehow have this this. Uh, you know, uh, utopia of peace. But that's not what the word shalom is. When, Paul, when, when David says, go after, seek after the shalom of God. See, the word shalom literally means wholeness, to be made safe and sound, and to prosper. And to prosper. In fact, if you, go to, if you go to Israel, and even today in the, 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 the Hebrew language today uh, in, 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 in Israel, the Jews will, will greet you in the morning, shalom, the afternoon, shalom, tonight, shalom. Um, and their greeting literally, now I know that you've heard this before, uh, because this has been kind of coined within the church, but it is exactly what shalom means. It means to be made safe and sound where nothing is missing, nothing is broken, and nothing is lacking in your life. Hallelujah. Now, you know, turn with me just very briefly there. Let's go and have a look at, at, at John chapter 3, the Gospel of John chapter 3. And... Um, Verses 16 and, and 17. Now, <laughs> you, we all know this passage of Scripture. I guess that as a believer, all of us have quoted this passage of Scripture many times out of different uh, translations. I'm going to use, uh, brother, I'm going to use the Amplified Version in this passage of Scripture here. So I want to just have a look at this because uh, David says that we need to inquire after. We need to seek after. We need to go and do whatever is necessary to acquire shalom. Now, uh, I want to show you out of the scripture here what Jesus did and what Jesus came to do. Now, you know, in, in John chapter 3 and verse 16, verse 16 uh, is what, G what God sent Jesus to do for us. Verse 17 is what God sent Jesus not to do for us. Amen. Now let's, let's just read this out of the Amplified Version. It says, For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world. Everybody say the world. Now the term the world there is not referring to the planet, earth. It's referring to all of humanity, for God so loved people. What, what people? All people. Good people, bad people, evil people, holy people, black people, white people, yellow people, red people, today, purple people. Yeah, I mean, there's some people that have tattooed their whole bodies purple. Amen. 
Now people, people's lives matter. <laughs> Amen. So what I'm trying to get across is that this scripture says, for God so loved people, period, that he gave his only begotten, now the Amplified says, that he even gave up his only begotten unique son, that whosoever believes in trust in claims to relies on him shall not perish, come to destruction, be lost, but have eternal everlasting life. Now, you know, we use that term eternal life. Uh, you know, in our, in our normal, uh, you know, King James or, or the NIV or something like that, you know, it says eternal life. And so we just attach this idea of eternal life as the fact that I'm going to live forever. That means I'm, 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 I'm never going to die or cease to be. Um, yeah, th that's true. The, the reality is uh, as a believer, you're going to live forever. That means you're never going to cease to be. But there's no human being that has ever been born on this planet that's not going to live forever. Everybody's going to live forever as if, if, if it comes to the longevity of life, if you want to put it that way. We're all going to live. It, it just depends on where you're going to live. It just depends on the quality of life you live. Amen. So what this is saying here is more, it's more about not so much about how long you're going to live or how you're going to live for eternity, but it is that Jesus came, that whosoever should believe in him should be able to live a quality of life. You see, living in the peace of God is part of the quality of God's Zoe life. Amen. And so Jesus came so that, that whosoever should believe in him should be able to live and enjoy and live in the, in the, 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 the fruit of that uh, quality of life. Now look at verse 17. It says, For God did not send the Son into the world in order to judge, to reject, to condemn, or pass sentence on the world. Isn't that powerful? So verse 16 tells us what God sent Jesus to do. Verse 17, especially the A part of the first part of verse 17, is very clear of what God did not send Jesus to do. Now, here's the thing for me, is that if God never sent Jesus for the purpose of judging, condemning, passing sentence on the world, on people, why is it that we as the church are forever judging, condemning, and passing sentence on the world? Amen? We're, we're con we are constantly doing that. And yet, here we are as Christians. You see, the reason we do that is because we ourselves are living in a place of condemnation, guilt, a place of where we feel judged and condemned. Amen. You see, it's, it's a way of alleviating your guilt by judging somebody who you deem to be worse than you. Amen. If you can't say amen, say, oh me. Uh, it's the truth, right? And so what he's saying here is this. It, God never sent Jesus for the purpose of judging, condemning, and passing sentence on the world. But unfortunately, so much of what we hear preached from the pulpit is about how God is going to condemn and judge and, and bring judgment upon the world. Come on. All right, let me move on here. <laughs> and it says... He says, but that the world, now listen to this. Now, what does the word shalom mean? It means to be made safe and sound where nothing is missing, nothing is broken, and nothing is lacking. Now, notice what he says here. He says, uh, but where did that go now? Yeah, I know, but it, my, I know. <laughs> But my page, yeah, I know my, my page, my page flipped over. It says, but that the world 
might be find salvation and be made safe and sound through him. Amen. Hallelujah. So, you know, the, the reason I want to want to bring this to you is that that this is the reason Jesus came is so that we can live within the shalom of God. That we could live as believers and we can live in a world that is unstable but be stable. Amen. Hallelujah. And so it's so important. Go with me there. Let's go and have a look at First Peter chapter 3 and verse uh, 10 through verse 11. And now this is a New Testament account of, of basically the same passage of Scripture out of Psalm 34. And so Peter now gives us a New Testament uh, understanding of David's words. And he says in verse 10, 1 Peter 3, verse 10, he says, For let him who wants to enjoy life and see good days, good whether apparent or not, keep his tongue from evil and his lips from guile, treachery, deceit. Let him turn away from wickedness and shun it, and let him do right. Now listen, let him search for peace. Now the Amplified, uh, the reason I read this out of the Amplified is because the Amplified gives us a great it amplifies. That's exactly what it does. It amplifies. And it gives us a great definition of what the New Testament understanding of peace. Old Testament understanding is the word shalom, which means to be safe and sound, where nothing is missing, nothing is broken, and nothing is um, missing, right? Something like that. I, I always get that mixed up. But listen to what he says. He says, let him search for peace, harmony, undisturbedness from fears, agitating passions, and moral conflicts, and seek it eagerly. Do not merely desire peaceful relations with God, your fellow men, and with, uh, uh, with yourself, but pursue, go after them. Now what he's saying, he says, don't, don't merely just look for peace between one another, with, between, between you know, friends or, or relationships, uh, or even with God. Establish yourself in the peace of God, which they determine here, harmony, undisturbedness from fear. So what, what I want to show you here is this, is that David in the Old Testament and, and, both, and Peter in the New Testament makes it very clear that we cannot just expect the peace of God to by chance just fall on us like rain out of the sky. What both of these people are saying is you and I need to pursue and go after it and do whatever it takes. Yeah. You know, listen, the, the, the word there to seek here in the Greek means to uh, search out by any means possible and whatever it takes to obtain. You need to pursue it. Look, look for it. See, um, both David and Peter are telling us that peace is vitally important for you to live and to, uh, 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 to, to enjoy a stable life. But you're going to have to go after it. It's not just going to automatically just fall on you. It's not the way it is. See, as Christians, it's, it's interesting. Like, you know, Christians, we talk about Jesus. If you're a preacher, and you'll know this, you know, you'll, if you preach a message and you say something like, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. It's amazing. It's kind of like people get reacting. Yes, amen, hallelujah. Yes, he's the Prince of Peace. We talk about the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Peace. We talk about the, the gospel we preach is the gospel of peace. Yes, people are, the, but the true reality is that most believers are tormented. Most believers do not experience or live in the peace of God. Oh, we can talk volumes about it. We can almost get excited about it. But sadly, many believers are spiritually insecure, emotionally unstable, and so many believers today are living with disorder. All kinds of disorders. 
All kinds of disorders. Sleeping disorders. Come on now. It's amazing. I, I talk to people all the time. And it, one, of the, one of the plagues of the, of the life that we're living in right now. You know, I was, I was listening um, uh, to a, 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 a teaching where this lady was talking about um, uh, that no disease is incurable. No disease known to mankind is incurable. And basically what she was, what she was saying is this. Now, it's a, it's, it, it's a pretty in-depth teaching that she does, and she's a, she's a, 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 a medical scientist. And she was saying this. She says that medical science today are starting to realize that all diseases... Now, there's a difference between diseases and sicknesses. You know, a sickness is something that, that for the most part, uh, is contracted through viruses and stuff like that from the outside. But this, the diseases that we have today that plagues humanity is directly related to stress. And, and I mean, it's fascinating to, to actually understand that science today starting to realize that if we will deal with the root problem of all of the diseases, instead of dealing, see, medical science for the most part, all they're doing is they treat the symptoms and never deal with the root problem of what disease, where the diseases actually come from, the disorders that people have, eating disorders and sleeping disorders, social disorders, um, uh, uh, addictions of, of, of all kinds uh, is stress-related. And, and, and basically what, and then she talks about, um, and, and I'm going to talk about this in a moment here, and she talks about what religion does. And, you know, and she uses the term, the, the only export of religion is fear, condemnation, and guilt, which is the root cause of the, most of the stress that people live in. <laughs> it's amazing stuff. See, people <coughs> are not just to know about the peace of God. See, so many Christians know about They can quote the scriptures. We can get excited about the fact that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And, but we actually have to experience that peace. We need to live in that peace. Now, the, a, a big part of the problem is our tendency towards religion. And legalism as believers see we can we can preach and promise peace as much as we want to but if our understanding and our perception of the of Christianity is still deeply uh, rooted in religion legalism and self-righteousness we are never going to experience peace because whenever people struggle with their inability to please and appease their view of an angry God, they are always going to live with mental distress. <laughs> See, a person who is continually and constantly tormented by guilt cannot live in... Listen, you can, you, can, you can confess as much as you want to. But if you live in guilt perpetually, you see, you can call yourself a Christian. You see, I, I get people, well, I'm a, I'm a child of God, hallelujah. Yes, that's true. But most people who believe that they are a child of God, they can't in experience the inheritance of that child. 
You can claim all of the promises. I can remember, you know, years and years ago, long before there were actually published promise books. <laughs> I, I had my own little book in which I went through the Scriptures and found promises in the Word of God, and I wrote down all the promises, and I confessed them, and I, I, I shouted them. I, I, you know, and the problem is, is that I could never experience ever any of them. You can claim the promises of God, but never enjoy them. In religion and legalism, you can, uh, 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 you can be promised salvation, but you can never feel saved. You, you can be promised peace, but never be peaceful. See, every religion in the world... Now, how many of you understand that Christianity is not a religion? You know, again, I don't know, I, I, I recognize some of the faces here that I've seen before, but I, there's people here that I've never seen before. And, and I always say this, I say, I hate religion. Amen. Amen. And the religion I hate worse than any other religion is Christian religion. Because Christianity is not a religion, never has been a religion. Now, we in the world, especially here in America, you know, it's like, again, these are things that we all, we all speak the same or, or a common language, right? Uh, but, but, you know, when you come and live, you come from South Africa and you come and live in the States, you realize we speak a common language, but that doesn't mean that we understand each other. <laughs> it's true. It's like one of the first things I started realizing here when I came in to, to America is that I would go anywhere, you know, be on an airplane or I'd go somewhere and people say, well, what do you do? Well, I'm a preacher. I, I preach the gospel. Oh, what religion are you? See, you know, where I come from, it's like if you ask somebody what religion are you, are you a Buddhist or are you a Confucianist or are you, a, you know, a, 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 if, are you a Muslim or... That's religions. But I found out here in America that most people's idea of religion is denomination. What denomination are you? You know? And so, but you, you see, we, we've, we've equated Christianity with religion. But, but Christianity is not a religion. religion. Religion is all about what man thinks he ought to do and should do for God. Christianity is all about what God has already done for you. That's what Christianity is about. Now, when we mix those two thoughts or that concept together, we come up with the deadest, driest religion you can ever be involved in. In fact, I usually tell people, if religion is what you're looking for, I have better ones than Christianity to point you to. Amen. If, if religion is what you're looking for, I'm not looking for religion. Amen. I'm looking for Christianity, and I am a Christian and live as a Christian. You see, all religions have a promise of peace, but you can never be peaceful. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ has the ability to actually deliver on the promise. Only the gospel. There's only the gospel of Jesus Christ that can deliver on this promise. What are we doing? How are we doing for time? I still have 15 minutes? Okay. Well, let's go to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Let's go and have a look at this here, and, and, and hopefully I can, I can do this. If not, we'll kind of we'll stop and just start <laughs> wherever, wherever we stop, and we'll start again, right? Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through to verse 14. Now, this is the, the, um, the advent of Christ. This is, this is uh, the account of where Jesus Christ uh, comes uh, in the incarnation. Now, we, we, we talk about the incarnation almost as just the birth of Jesus Christ. But, you know, the, the term incarnation means that, that, that God has come in the flesh. In fact, the whole of Jesus' life was the incarnation of God. Amen. And uh, notice what happens here. 
This is the story of the, of the uh, shepherds in the field. And it says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the, the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were sore, I like the old King James, and they were sore afraid. You know, uh, it, I, I always joke, I said they were so afraid it even hurt. They were, they were, they were, they were basically, this old English for saying, and they were terrified. Now, I want to, I want to stop there for a moment, and I'm, and, and I don't want to rush this, because I think that a lot of people have never really thought about this. I know that for the longest time, I never thought about this. Because, you see, as human beings, we are all pre-programmed almost to be afraid of God. Amen. Now, this, this year says that the glory of the Lord, the, the presence of God, the, the Shekinah of God, the manifestation of His presence was shining all around about them, and they were terrified. Now, turn with me in your Bibles, and, and keep your finger there, and go with me to Genesis. Let's go and have and establish something here out of Genesis. Now, in Genesis chapter, of course, Genesis chapter 1 is the synopsis of creation and then Genesis chapter 2 is a bit more in detail about the creation and then Genesis chapter 3 is about what we are uh, referred to in the church as the fall of man uh, you know where, where, where sin came into the world um, you know whichever way you look at it but I call I like to call it the the fall of man now <clears throat> I want to show you something here and hopefully you can Hopefully this can be that grace gift that I can just give you that just will never stop giving to you, all right? Now notice it says that the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree in the garden. So the old enemy comes in the form of a serpent. And he speaks to uh, Eve, but we know he's speaking to Eve. But the Bible tells us that Adam was with her. So Adam was right there with her, although the old enemy is talking to Eve. Uh, the, old, the, old enemy, the enemy knows that Adam is there. He's there with her. He's listening. He's hearing what's going on. Now, he could have he butted in any minute, you know, in this. He didn't do that. And, and says, and of course, the woman says uh, to the serpent, he says, um, he says, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, God hath said, uh, you shall uh, not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. For God doeth know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, I want to draw your attention to here, and, and I don't want to make too much of this. Uh, Genesis here does not tell us. There's no indication here of how long Adam and Eve lived in the garden from when God created them created the garden, put them in the garden. It doesn't tell us how long, how long Adam and Eve lived there until they, they sinned. I mean, we read Genesis chapter 1, we read Genesis chapter 2, day 1, day 2, day 3, they sinned. Right? So in our minds, we look at this, and it was like, you know, God created them, He put them in the garden, they, uh, they named all the animals, and then the next day they sinned. No. I, I believe there's every indication, really, that they lived in the garden and lived in the presence of God and lived in communion with God for a long time. Somebody said this to me. I, I don't know if a person can look at it, but I, I thought it's quite interesting. He said, you know, 
we don't, we are not given the time that Adam and Eve lived uh, until they sinned. After they sinned, it tells us how long they lived. Uh, it, and, and maybe it's because when they were created, the original design was to never die. So why in the world would you want to count your days if you're going to live forever? Right? So there's no need to say this is how long they were there. Now, the reason I say this is that, that I want you to understand that they lived in the garden and lived in communion and fellowship with God. Not just one day or two days for a long time. How long, I'm not sure. But I'm, 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 I'm telling you it's not a couple of days. They were used to fellowshipping with God. Uh, when we read here now that God came down in the cool of the day, this was not the first time God did this. Are you with me? This is, this is something they've been used to all the time. But I want to show you something here. And I hope you, I really, I, I, I really hope that you get it. You know, the woman, of course, you know, says uh, uh, that we can, we, we can eat of all of the trees in the garden, but of the fruit of the tree of the, in the midst of the garden, we shouldn't eat, neither, neither should we touch it. The old enemy says, no, no, <laughs> God knows. Well, here's the deception. God knows that the day you eat thereof, you will be like him or like God's, knowing good. And, well, if you go to chapter 1 and verse 26, it says they were created in the image of God, in his likeness. They were already like God's. Uh, let me put it this way. That means as human beings, we are God beings. We are not angelic beings. We are God beings. We are of the God kind. We are, we are created, and they were created. In the, but the old enemy says, no, 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 no. You need to do something to be like God. I call it the do-to-be tree. You have to do this in order to be. Now, what's interesting is the day that they believed that lie, believed that they, they believed that they were not like God, they needed to do something to become like God, from that day, you and I and every human being identifies ourselves with what we do. From that moment on, something happened within the humankind. Is that we have from that moment on, I mean, you look at, and speak to most people. And say, to, well, who are you? Well, I'm Andrew. Um, okay, uh, and so Andrew... Uh, so who are you? Well, I'm, a, I'm, I'm the local plumber. My identity is connected to what, what I do. I'm the, I'm the doctor. I'm a lawyer. I'm a preacher. Come on now. No, that's not... I am? No, you, you, you am not. That's what you do. That's not what you am. I know that's not good English, but I hope you can get that. Amen. The next thing that I want to show you here is this. It says that after they had eaten of the fruit of the tree, it says that, verse 18, and the Lord God, sorry, verse uh, 17. Let me see here. I'm reading. No, not 17. Guys, it's a little early for me. You know, I, I woke up, what, 4.30 this morning? It's like, you know. Um, but if you go down to verse uh, 8, it says, And they, uh, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now here's God coming down and fellowshipping with him. Now I, I want you to see that there's no indication in this passage of Scripture that God came down, stomped his foot and said, What have you done? Now, how many of you know that God knew they sinned? Amen. Now, if you read chapter 3, it almost looks like he doesn't know. Because he kind of asks Adam, you know, who, who told you you were naked? And, and, and all that kind of stuff. Well, what he's doing is, is he, wants, he wants Adam to admit to what's going on here. But 
we know that God is an omnipotent, omnipresent God. He knows all things. So he knew that they had sinned. But I want you to see here, there's no indication that God comes down in the cool of the day and is angry. He's not even disappointed. Okay, so this is what I want you to see, is that Adam's sin never changed God's mind about Adam and Eve. I mean, God didn't come down, stomp his foot and said, I told you not to do that. And from now, this minute, I am going and I am hiding myself. No, he comes in the cool of the day to fellowship with them. Now, who changes their minds? Adam and Eve change their minds about God. Not God changing his mind about them. And notice what it says here. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the the garden in the cool of the day. And and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. First thing that happened is they go and they hide from the presence of the Lord. And it says, and God called unto Adam. Adam. Adam, where are you? And Adam comes out, and it says, uh, he comes out from behind the trees of the garden, and he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid. Watch this. The first words of mankind The first words of mankind after sin, I'm afraid. Now, what this means is that, now how many of you understand that Adam and Eve, although I believe in physical creation, that they were two physical beings, right? I do believe there's an allegory in what we see in Adam and Eve. What you see in Adam and Eve after the fall is a reflection of what's true in mankind. From the day Adam and Eve fell and sin entered into their consciousness, fear became the default setting of man's belief toward God. That means... Every man, it is our default to be afraid of God. And we see this here in Luke, here. In Luke, the first thing, the presence of God comes down. Now, you know, it's an interesting thing. Uh, Right through the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, every time God comes on the scene, every time God comes in contact with man, God has to say, Be not afraid. Somebody told me the other day, a friend, a good friend of mine said to me that, uh, and I've not studied this out, so I'm quoting him. So if it's wrong, then it's his fault. (laughs) That, That there's 365 accounts in the scripture that God says, do not be afraid or fear not. 365 is once for every day of the year. So w- w- what is this saying to, to us? God, every time he comes in contact with man, any man, and fear is there, he doesn't say, you better be. No, he says, do not be afraid. Fear not. Now, let me ask you this. Would God be the one that every time he comes, say to you, to anybody, Fear not, if actually behind the scenes, you need to be afraid. No, of course not. What is God saying? What is the scripture saying to us? 
It's saying God is not somebody to be afraid of. Well, after the Bible says the fear of the Lord. Well, we all know this, and if you don't know this, the Scripture is real clear. The fear of the Lord is, you know, the beginning of wisdom. The Bible talks about fear of the Lord. Well, that fear of the Lord, Jesus, when Jesus quotes that, he says, the worship of God, the reverential worship of God. It is, it is a reverent, reverence for God, but not to be afraid, not to be scared of God. Amen. Hmm. But in this, in this, in, and this is, I call this the iniquity of man. You know, sin is divided into different categories. Sin, iniquity, and transgression. Iniquity is not the thing you do wrong. It's what sin does to you. It's the condition sin, sin leaves you in. See, sin left Adam and Eve in the condition of being afraid. Now, I, it's important that you remember this because later on we're going to talk about this, okay? Now, it, it, verse, verse 10 says, And the angel said unto them, Fear not. This is going back there to Luke chapter 2 and verse 10. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. <laughs> this message is to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, which, uh, 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 which is a Savior, sorry, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Goodwill toward men. You see, uh, what, we, what we're seeing here is the announcement of the advent of Christ and God through the angels are saying glory to God in the highest. In fact, what this says to me is that there was such joy in the heavenly realms that it couldn't be contained. It burst forth into this physical realm saying, finally, there is something or somebody that has come that is finally going to be able to show you that there is peace between God and man. <sighs> After 4,000 years of mankind hiding, 4,000 years of mankind being afraid. 4,000 years of religious teaching that has made men afraid. Finally, right now, there is a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. And when you know and see him, he is the, he is the God of creation incarnate. Oh, hallelujah. Get me excited about this. Hallelujah. He is God for the first time, we can actually see who God really is. Up until that point, we've only had men's skewed ideas of who they think God is. Now God has come in a body of a man that you can fully see hallelujah, and see that there is peace peace. Whew, hallelujah. The announcement of peace. See, if we as believers are going to live and walk uh, in peace towards others, if we're going to experience peace in our circumstances, in our lives, we must first become established in the peace of God within our, our inner consciousness. Our inner consciousness. That means that there needs to be a consciousness within us that produces peace. Amen? Let's break here. Okay? We'll break here and start and, and we'll pick it up from here. Give God a hand. Amen.
Amen, amen. Um, some people asked me a little bit, I would also just, um, you know, if you go back to our table there, we have some information about our ministry, some, they've got something over there for you, brother. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, has, has everybody been able to give? Okay, there's some more there. Um, there are some uh, pamphlets at the back there, uh, brochures, um, and some newsletters that you can pick up there. And somebody asked me just in the break about um, our newsletter. Uh, I have a little sign-up sheet here. And what I'd like to do is maybe start over there. And if you want to be on our mailing list, receiving a uh, newsletter, monthly newsletter, uh, at the back there's one there that's an example of what we do. It's just a one-page short little teaching on there gives you some information about where we uh ministering around the world uh you can either do that via via physical address or an email address but we'd like to if you want to be on it so i'm going to put it over there and and pass it around i mean you don't have to fill it in if you don't want to but if you do just pass it around so it's starting over there so at the end of the day it should be over there Okay, <laughs> I'm going to check. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. How many of you are blessed? Amen. Blessed with heaven's best. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Best. God does not give us his second best. He gave us his best. All right, so in the previous lesson that we did, or the previous um, uh, an hour or so that we were 45, I tried to stick to 45 minutes, I went over that, but um, we, were, we ended off really just es establishing the fact that when Jesus came, we as believers, if we are going to live um, and, and walk in peace um, towards other people in our communities, um, in, our, in, in the world that we live in, if we're going to experience peace in our circumstances, how many of you desire to experience peace in every circumstance of your life to to experience to live in that peace if we're going to do that then we are going to have to become established in the peace of god in our inner consciousness and um, i think the best way to do this is to First of all, establish again. Now, we've already talked about this, but we're going to just establish what peace is and is not. Because again, the, the, the carnal thought about peace is so far removed from what the peace of God really is. So what we're going to do is I just want to go through different definitions that we have. Now, we've already looked at the first one, which is the definition out of the Amplified Bible, which I think is a really good one. The first, the Amplified defines this peace, not as some kind of nirvana. This is how it says. It means to be free from agitating passions and moral conflicts. Now, you know, as believers, one of the things, how many of you understand that we live in a world where you are going to come in contact with conflicting morals? I mean, if you think, now, unless you want to go live in a Christian commune where everybody thinks the same and everybody believes the same until you don't believe, then they give you the left foot of fellowship. Amen. <laughs> Then, then you and I live in a world that we are constantly being bombarded with morals that conflict with our morals. It's, it's true, right? The problem is, is that we as Christians think that we can, we can actually go out there and then we are surprised that there are morals, other people's morals are conflicting with our morals. And then what happens is we live in the conflict of that. Amen. The peace of God is to be able to live in a world where there's conflicting morals, but not be conflicted by it. That means that you can actually live in a world where other people don't think like you do. But it's not going to disturb your peace. 
Amen. You see, so many Christians live with this all the time. And, 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 you know, and then they live with, with these agitating passions of fear. So many Christians live with this, with this fear of losing their salvation, losing God's favor, um, losing the anointing. I mean, you know, you're all the, well, I don't want to lose my anointing. You can't lose your anointing because the anointing of the anointed is in you and he ain't leaving. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. It's just not going to be that. You know, um, uh, the, now the Vines Expository Dictionary defines this peace. The, this is the Greek word for peace as harmony, the sense of rest and contentment. Now, listen to this freedom from molestation. Now, of course, the word molestation to, to molest. You know, we, we understand and in, in we talk about molestation. It's usually in the context of sexual molestation. Uh, but how many of you understand that, that there are so many people and so many believers who live uh, being molested by their thoughts Amen. daily? And so many believers live in absolute torment because they live in, in, uh, with thoughts that are molesting thoughts of shame, thoughts of inferiority, sh thoughts of condemnation and guilt. And, and those thought, that their thought life is, is molesting them on a constant basis. And so th 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 this definition of of peace is to be free from all molestation. Now, the, the, the definition, now for the students here, I'd really uh, encourage you to, to write this down because this is going to help you. The Thayer's Dictionary or Thayer's Word Study defines this, this same word, uh, and, and, and it's beautiful. And now what I'll do is I'll repeat it a couple of times so that you can write it down. It's not very long, but it's, it's not just a statement defines it like this, that peace, the peace of God, is the, is the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot of whatever sort that is. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that again. The tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. Now, this is the most important part. And so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot of whatever sort that is. Now, the, the, the last part of that definition used to always bother me a little until I understood. Because what he's saying here is that to be in the peace of God is to to have a, a tranquil soul assured of your salvation through Christ and so therefore fearing nothing from God and to be content with its earthly lot. Meaning, now, you see, content, I, I confused contentment with complacency. And I think a lot of people do, to be content you see, Paul said this. He says, I have learned to be content in whatever situation I find myself. What is, Paul, what, what is Paul explaining? He says, I've learned to be at peace. I've learned to be in the peace of God uh, in whatever, whatever circumstance I find myself in. See, contentment, to be Content is not to be complacent. Complacent means, uh, that means I'm in this situation and so I, there's nothing I can do about it. To be content is to say I'm content to be here in God and no matter what the situation, but my contentness in peace is what's going to lead me out of a situation that I might not find comfortable or, or that's what's going to lead me out of this is that See, most people stay within the realm of their circumstances 
bound by the circumstances of either poverty or fear or whatever that is. They live within that because they, the fear is the one that drives it. But when you are content in the peace of God, amen. How many of you want me to just quote that, that definition again quickly? You, okay, so I'm going to do it again. The tranquil state of a soul, assured of its salvation through Christ, and so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot of whatever sort that is. You see, for me, that is the, a, a, a beautiful uh, description, really, of what the peace of God is. See, uh, this contentment that we have in God, in the finished work of Jesus Christ, um, a lot of people try to obtain this peace through prayer Fasting, seclusion, meditation. And, and, and I want to just make this very clear. Is that this kind of peace is not something you can pray for. And I wish I could get Christians to get this. Because I have, you see, as a, as a preacher and as a minister, I will have peace. People come to me all the time, especially, you know, if I'm at a conference and I have people come and they'll say, but Arthur, would you just pray, just pray that, that the peace of God, that I might have the peace of God in this situation. I, now, you know, of course, most of the time I don't have time to explain to people. So what I do is I'll pray for them, <laughs> you know. But if I have time, I'll say, listen, I can't pray for peace. Because, see, peace is not something you can manufacture. You cannot manufacture peace by praying it up. You know, some people was like, I can remember there was a time in my life where I would go, as it were, in my prayer closet, and I would, you know, not want to come out there until I was in the peace of God. The problem is you can't pray for peace. Now people say, oh, well, the Bible says we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Yes, we can pray for peace in our, in our uh, uh, um, uh, you know, communities or in our country. Yes, we can pray for this physical peace between people. But we cannot pray and think that through prayer we're going to acquire the peace of God. See, the, the problem with us as Christians is we want Christianity to be magic. We want, we want, uh, uh, quote this, this, this passage of scripture three times and let the pastor wave his magic Bible over your head and boom, bam, I've got it. Doesn't work that way. See, because true, real, lasting peace is only ever experienced when you will encounter a living, loving God of peace. I'm going to say that again. True, lasting peace can only ever be experienced if you will encounter a true, living, loving God of peace. And what I mean by that is that peace is the result of encountering God for who he really is. Peace is, I would put it this way, the byproduct of a heart established in the kingdom of God. It's, it's, it's a, a heart persuasion. See, you can, I can, Pray for peace, but if your heart's not persuaded about the truth about who God really is and who you are, peace is the byproduct of a persuaded heart. Amen. And, you know, to explain this to you, let me, let me I want you to go with me to Proverbs chapter 16, verses 6 and 7. Um. Proverbs 16, 6 and 7, I'm going to read this also out of the Amplified Version. And, and, and again, only, I used it only because the Amplified, again, amplifies some things. Um, this is one of those passages of Scripture for me. This, 
we all should have favorite passages of Scripture. This is one of my most favorite passages of Scripture. This was a passage of Scripture that God dealt with me in years ago that brought me to the, 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 um, the impartation, as it were, of that, that grace gift that started to establish me in my walk and in my relationship with God and then, of course, in my life. And, um, and, and, you know, how many of you are familiar, if you keep your finger there in Proverbs 16, but how many of you are familiar with Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6, where Paul says that, um, you know, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything, but faith which worketh by love. Now, the reason I want to use this is I want to, because before we go read uh, Proverbs 16 and verse 6, I want us to have the right approach to that passage of Scripture. Now, the, the approach of us as human beings, again, what did we say? We, we went there to Genesis. We had a look at, at what happened in the fall of man. Uh, you know, one of the things that happened is that man became... Uh, fully connected with this whole performance. I am what I perform. I am what I do, right? And so it becomes the way we approach everything in our lives. Now, uh, Proverbs, uh, not Proverbs, Galatians 5 and verse 6. See, I, uh, I grew up, as it were, in the faith, faith movement, in the in the nineteen you know uh, the nineteen eighties nineteen nineties, and so, and thank God for the for the faith movement. But one of the things that happened is that I mean that passage of scripture was a passage we we used all the time, and 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 the way we looked at it, and the way that I I used to preach it, the way that I had always heard people preach, when we used that passage of scripture, faith. Faith uh, worketh by love. The word worketh there is the, the Greek word energia. It's energized. Faith is energized by love. And so, uh, you know, of course, that if you, if you found or felt that your faith is not working, that your faith is not energized, uh, we, would, we would, would say things like this. In fact, I, you know, heard many, many good men and women of God preach that if your faith is not working, one of the things you need to do is check your love life. Anybody hear that? And what we meant by that was that if your faith is not operating, your faith is not working, your faith is not energized, uh, usually that meant that if you're believing God for something and it ain't happening, then check your love life, meaning check that you're, that you're walking in love. And, and we use the term walking in love. How many of you understand the term of walking in love? Now, the, 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 the term that we use by, the, check if you're walking in love. What we meant by that was, check that you're being loving and kind in your relationships with others. Amen. Right? Okay, okay now let's, let's just use the same term. The same term. We're all sitting in this room. I can say, you all, in Texas, they would love me for that. You all are sitting in the light. I am walking in the light. There's light up there. I am walking in the light, meaning I'm walking in the benefit of what that light gives me. Am I right? You're sitting in the light and you're benefiting from what the light gives you. So when I say I am walking in the light, I'm not saying that light's coming from me. I'm not shining the light. Okay. Walking in the love of God is not saying that you need to do anything. Walking in the love of God means that you need to receive something. You need to be receiving the benefit of the love of God. 
That's to walk in. Now, <clears throat> I believe that what Paul was talking about here is this. Is he's saying that faith, your faith is energized when you will become a recipient of God's unconditional love for you. That means that you will continue to receive and be persuaded of God's love for you. That energizes your faith. Not, not you loving others energizes your faith. That's not what it says. It's when you will walk in the benefit of God's unconditional love for you. And whatever, whatever the benefits are from that love. Do you understand? Do you see that there's a, there's a, it, it's, a it's a, almost like a 180 degree opposite to the way that we always think. Now, go to, go to this passage of scripture. And let's read this passage of scripture with the same, the same attitude here. You see, because in Proverbs 16 and verse 6, the Amplified says, By mercy and love, truth and fidelity to God and man, not by sacrificial offerings, iniquity is purged out of the heart. Now remember what I said about iniquity. Remember when we were in Genesis, I said that, that iniquity is the, the result of what sin has done to us. What did sin do to man? It it changed the way we looked at God. It changed our opinion about God. It didn't change God's opinion about us. It changed our opinion about God. It changed what we believed about God. We went from being in a relationship with God where there was no fear, that the moment sin came in, iniquity left us in a place of being totally afraid of God. Amen. Okay, so, so what he's saying is this. He says, by mercy... And love, truth and fidelity. Fidelity is an old English word for faithfulness. By, by mercy and love, truth and fidelity, iniquity is purged out of your heart. Uh, I don't know if you guys get it. See, now, the, I, for years, I used to look at it this way. I used to look at that passage of Scripture and say that by mercy, if I would be merciful... If I would be kind, if I would be loving, if I would be truthful, and if I would be faithful, iniquity will be purged out of my heart. No. This is speaking, if I will allow God to be merciful to me. Come now. Now, you know, what, 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 is, the, what is the word mercy in the Bible? I have a whole series. I don't have any of it here. But I have a whole series where I teach on the mercy of God. What is the mercy of God? You know, I've heard people have, the, the, you know, most people have these little cliches about the mercy and grace and so on. But, you know, truly mercy, the mercy of God is derived. See, we have an idea of mercy. But God has an idea of mercy. And our idea of mercy is usually not God's idea of mercy. So God's idea of mercy is derived from the mercy seat of God. So when you, the biblical, the biblical understanding of mercy is, is demonstrated at the mercy seat of God. Now what happened at the mercy seat of God? You know, the mercy seat of God was, was the, the lid on top of the Ark of the Covenant where there were two cherubims with their, their, their wings stretched out to each other. And in between the wings of the cherubims is where the presence of God dwelt, the Shekinah glory, glory of God dwelt. And so uh, once a year, the priest would go in there with the sacrificial blood of the lamb and he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. And that place, the mercy seat of God became the place where God treated people better than they deserve. So whenever we read about the mercy of God in the Bible, Old and New Testament, it is always speaking about God's willingness, God's power, God's passion, His desire, and His ability to treat people better than they deserve. Amen. Amen. See, if you, if you and I will allow the God to be merciful to us. 
not to treat us according to what we deserve, but to allow God. Now, and, and I say this to allow, because you see, God has given you a free will, and God can do something for you if you won't allow Him to do it. See, God is merciful to you and desires to be merciful to you. He wants to treat you better than you deserve. But if you will not receive it, if you will not be open to it, then you can't experience it. But if you will allow God to be merciful and treat you better than you deserve, amen, and, and he says yeah, by mercy, by love, allowing God to love you. The fact is, brother and sister, God is an unconditional loving God. But if you don't allow him to love you, it will be of no effect to you. God is not going to force his love on you. You know, uh, my daughter, my, my uh, uh, second eldest daughter, um, when she turned 13, 14, 15, right about there, she just decided one day, or came to the conclusion that I don't love her. And so for years, no matter what I did, no matter how much I loved her, no matter how, no matter, no matter how much love I, I tried to pour on her, she would not receive it and she could not see it and would not believe it. And no matter what I do. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, you think to yourself, well, what can I do? How can I? Well, it's the same with God. As long as you believe and feel that God can't love you, you shouldn't be loved of God. God can't love me because I'm not lovable. No matter how much God loves you, it's not going to benefit you. And, you know, she's, what, she's 33 now. And uh, last year, actually, the end of last year, she was visiting with us. Um, and, and my son-in-law had gone away for a couple of weeks and she came over and stayed with my wife and I, with the, with the grandkids, you know. And, and uh, one night late, we were just sitting at the dining room table, and we were just talking about old time. And then she came and she said to me, Dad, can you remember those days? I said, yeah, of course I can remember those days. And then she said, she said, how dumb can you be and still breathe? She said, I don't understand how I ever thought that, how I ever believed that. But you see, the thing is, though, is that religion will, will bring you to a place where you, will you, you don't, you'll find it hard to, to submit to God's love and His merciful uh, 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 actions towards you. You see, by mercy and love, truth, the truth of who God really is. And His faithfulness, he, listen to this, His faithfulness, even though you are unfaithful. Allow God to be the one who stays faithful, even though you are faithless. And if we do that, and allow God to be that, what it will do is purge your heart of iniquity. It will purge your heart of the stinking thinking that we have. Amen. Amen. Now, notice what it says here. He says, By mercy and love, truth and fidelity, iniquity is purged out of the heart, and by rever the reverent, worshipful fear of the Lord, men depart from evil and, and, and avoid evil. When a man's ways please the Lord. <laughs> See, now it's a bit, ah, oh, my ways. Oh. Yeah. Listen, you're going to understand something. How many of you here believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Believe, believe. Okay, now this, this is what Jesus said. Jesus said this. How many of you believe Jesus' words? They came to Jesus and they said to Jesus, Jesus, what are the works that we need to do that would please God? Jesus said this, believe on him whom he has sent. You want, basically they were coming, Jesus, what must we do that our ways may please God? Jesus said, believe on me, whom, or, or believe on him whom he has sent. 
There's not point number two and do something else. That's the only point there is. If you believe on Jesus, your ways please the Lord. And he says, if a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Or I like what the message says. When God approves of your life. <laughs> when God approves of your life. Well, the fact that Jesus came and died for you is because God approves of you. Hallelujah. He says, even your enemies will end up shaking your hand. Hallelujah. See, the peace of God is the ultimate expression of, or let me put it this way, the ultimate spiritual expression of a man or a woman living in the kingdom of God. That's what he is. Turn with me in your Bible. Again, how many of you believe that Jesus understood things about the kingdom? Amen. Jesus and Paul gives us a very good insight into the dynamics of the kingdom of God. Now, I do know and understand that there's a lot being said today about the kingdom of God. Uh, there's a lot of teaching about the kingdom and the reign of God. And, and there's some good teaching. And, but um, I believe that what, what we sometimes do is we... Have you ever noticed how we complicate things? Pastor and I were talking about this last night. And, and what we do is we forget about the simplicity of the gospel, the simplicity of the kingdom of God. And so, you know, there's a lot of people that I've, I've heard uh, teach about the king. Turn with me to Luke chapter 17. Luke 17, verses 20 and, and 21. Um, I'm going to read from the, those passages of Scripture there, and then we're going to look at a couple of other things. Now, this is where, where Jesus instructs us and I believe gives us the, the, the uh, fundamental simplicity of the kingdom of God. Now, I know that there are some people that teach that the kingdom of God, and if you read the Gospels, there's also the term the kingdom of heaven. Now, I know that there's, there are people that teach that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are two different things, and that they refer to do two different things. I, I, I've studied this, uh, not recently, but I've, uh, in times gone by, I've really studied this in depth. And my findings have just come to the conclusion that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God is, is uh, just two different terms referring to the same thing. But that there's, not, that there's not a difference between the two. Now, there are some people that, that, that hold to the fact that, that these are two different things. And boy, I tell you what, if you disagree with them, then, of course, you're a heretic. So, um, and, and if that's how you see it, I'm sorry, but then I'm a heretic. But um, the, the truth is, is that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven is really speaking about the same things, just different terms that are used in the Gospels. Now, Jesus comes and he says here in Luke chapter 17 and verse 20 and 21, he says, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come. Now, of course, you know, the Pharisees, the Jews in that day, they believed in the, the they, they preached the kingdom of God. You know, Jesus wasn't the only one that preached the kingdom of God. In, in the day of Jesus, Jesus uh, preached on the kingdom of God. Uh, and the Pharisees talked about the kingdom of God, but their view of the kingdom was that the, when the Messiah comes, he's going to come and he's going to set up a physical, political kingdom that will be ruling on this earth and, and, and of course, overthrow the Roman Empire and establish a physical kingdom where God is going to rule and Israel is going to be their favorite people and, of course, you know, the whole deal. That's what they were looking for. So they demanded of Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? And he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. So Jesus, they said, Jesus, when is the kingdom of God going to come? When are you going to establish the kingdom of God here? And Jesus says, let me tell you about the kingdom. First thing, the kingdom of God 
is not going to come with observation. That means the kingdom of God is not going to be a place that you can observe with your physical eyes. It's not going to be a place. You can't point. In fact, he, he says it like this. He says, it does not come with observation. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Oh, so what he's saying is this. Is the kingdom of God is not a a physical place that you can observe with your eyes. It's, it's not going to be a place that I can take you to and say, lo there, or lo here it is. Because the kingdom of God is an is a inward kingdom. It's an internal kingdom. Are you with me here? So, so Jesus is real clear. He says it's not going to be. So most people are looking for this 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 kingdom of, of, of actually ruling on this earth they, that I can point to. And Jesus says it's not going to happen that way. The kingdom of God is an internal kingdom. Now, go with me to Romans chapter 14. And in Romans 14, Paul, <coughs> I believe, kind of gives us some more insight into this. Paul says, Romans 14, verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, now, so, so Paul comes, he says, the kingdom of God is not about what you eat or what you drink. Now, why does he use the term, what you eat or what you drink? The rules of the Jews. So he's really referring to, it's not about rules. It's not about principles. It's not about rules of, of doing things a certain way or eating certain food or, or not eating certain food. It's, it's, this is not what the kingdom of God is about. He says the kingdom of God, listen to this. He says, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. I want you to listen carefully. So what's he saying? He says, this is what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is not... So, Jesus said, the kingdom of God doesn't come with observation. It's not a place you can go to that say, there it is. The kingdom of God is an inward kingdom, internal kingdom. Paul says the kingdom of God is not about what you do and what you don't do. The kingdom of God is righteousness. Now, you see that term righteousness for most people is right doing. No, 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 no. The kingdom of God is being in a position of right standing with God. I say it this way. The kingdom of God is a state of being. The kingdom of God is a state of being. It's a state of being made righteous in the presence of God. Which produces peace. And the reason I say that is if you go to like uh, 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 Romans uh, chapter 5, uh, you know, Paul says that, that, that therefore being made righteous, we have peace with God. So what he's saying is, is that the, the person who will believe that they have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and fully become persuaded of that in your heart comes to a place of a state of being that when you wake up, you know that you're righteous, accepted, that you're loved of the Father, that you know, and your state of being, which produces peace. There is no other way that the peace of God comes. You can't pray for it. You can't confess it. You can't hype it. Uh, you can't fast it. It comes by persuading yourself of the fact that you're righteous, through the finished work of Jesus Christ, which produces peace and causes you to live in the joy of the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Amen. And so, so what happens, uh, and for me through this, is that uh, 
the view that Jesus had of, of the kingdom of God is that a man who lives in the peace of God is a man who's living in the kingdom of God, being persuaded of their right standing with God. See, if a man is not at peace with God in this manner, then he cannot be at peace with anybody around him. He cannot and will not have peace uh, in, in any area of his life at all. Amen? Hallelujah. How are we doing for time here? I went through that pretty quickly. Am, am I still doing good? <laughs> How, you, you say we need to go back until quarter till? Okay, good. Well, let's go a little bit further. Turn with me to, to uh, John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Um, I'm, I'm going to speak to you about the legacy of peace. The legacy of peace. Jesus comes in John 14 and verse, verse um, 25. Sorry? Did anybody say? Uh, sorry, I thought somebody said something. Um, John 14, verse 25 and ver through to verse 27. We're just going to read through that. This is where Jesus comes and he says, I have told you these things while I am still with you. But the Comforter, everybody say Comforter. comforter. The Comforter is the Holy Spirit, right? The Comforter, the Counselor, the Helper, the Intercessor, the Advocate, the Strengthener, the Standby, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, in my place, to represent me and act on my behalf. He will teach you all things. And He will cause you to recall, will remind you of, or bring to your remembrance everything that I have told you. Man, that's powerful. So Jesus uh, basically is saying this, that when the Holy Spirit comes, He's going to be the one who's going to teach you, and He's going to teach you what? All things. But what I love about what He's saying, He says, He will cause you to recall or remind you of or bring to your remembrance everything that I have told you. Now, you know, it's an interesting thing. I went and had a look at that because, you see, we, in our English language, our English language is so limited that we use the term, that everything that I have told you, then we think about everything that Jesus said. But do you understand that Jesus told you a lot of things by just doing some things? He, so the, the, the term that, uh, the, the, the Greek term that you, everything I told you is actually everything I communicated to you. Everything I've communicated to you. Everything I've come to show you. He says, the Holy Spirit is going to remind you of these things. See, Jesus, right now, just think about this for a moment. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he is in a position of total and absolute peace with the Father. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much in this. That Jesus is a man seated at the right hand of the Father. Just like we can identify with Adam, the first Adam, in, in what he did for us, we can now identify in the last Adam, seated at the right hand of the Father, that means as much as he is in a position of total peace, well, position of total right standing with God, you are in right standing with God. He is in a place of total peace with God. Why? Because Jesus, in what he came to do and everything that he accomplished, he removed every accusation, every, he removed every indictment or charge that can disturb your peace. Hey, hey hallelujah. Turn with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. There's, there's, uh, again, there's so much that we can talk about here, but I don't want to, uh, you know, I don't want to get too far away from, removed from just keeping this idea of the peace of God. But, you know, Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse, um, let's read from verse 14. Paul, uh, in, the, in the old King James, Paul says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one man died for all, then... We're all dead. 
Isn't that a powerful statement? I, I, you know, it's, it, I think that sometimes we read over these things. What he's saying is this. Paul comes and he says, listen, when I look at what Christ accomplished for us on the cross, or what Christ came to communicate to us, let's put it that way. He says, the Holy Spirit is going to remind you of everything I've come, I've come to communicate to you. Well, this is, he said, Paul says, when I think about what, what, what Christ came to communicate with us, he says, the love of Christ, the love of God in Christ constrains me. That word constrain means to lay siege upon me. Because I thus judge that if one man died, who's the one man? Then all are dead. All what? All Christians are dead? All men. The, the truth in God's perspective is that when Jesus died on that cross, he represented every human being that has lived is living, and will ever come to live. And as far as God's concerned, every one of them died with him on that cross. Amen. Now, <clears throat> now we, 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 we say it like this. Hopefully, I'm, I'm able to, to, to bring this uh, across correctly. We say we died with him. Yes, it's true, we died with him. But I would also say this, that when he died, he died as you. He died as you. Yes, because he died as me, therefore I died with him. <laughs> Can you see that? All right, now watch this. He says, Wherefore henceforth know we no man, sorry, verse 15, for that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Now you see the old English here talks about dying for them, dying with him. You know, now if you, and you can go and study this. Some of you here are Bible students, so you can go look it up for yourself. If you go and look at the words there when, in verse 15, it says, that, uh, and let's, I'll read from verse 14. For the love of God constrains or lays siege upon my heart. He says, because we thus judge that if one died for all, or one died, the word for there in the Greek, it can be, it can be as. For, as. He died as us. We are all dead with him. Amen. He didn't just die because, see, Jesus was a human being. Amen. And in Jesus Christ, he represents like the first Adam represents all of humanity. This, the last Adam represents all of humanity in him. Are you with me here? Amen. All right. Now notice he says, and that he died for all, I could put as all, <laughs> that they which live should not henceforth live unto or as themselves. But unto him or as him, hallelujah, who died for them or as them uh, and rose again. See, I tell you, Jesus and you are so intertwined that, that I, I call it intimately inseparable from Christ. You are intimately inseparable from Christ. That it's impossible to separate you from Christ. Amen. So what he's just saying this is, if it's true that Jesus, when he died on the cross, he, he died for us, as us, then all of us are dead. Therefore, you don't need to live as yourself anymore. You can now live as him who died as you so that you could live as him. Amen. <laughs> 
And let me tell you, Jesus ain't worried. <laughs> He's not worried, amen. And that he died as all, or for all, that they which should now henceforth, uh, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him, or as him, uh, which died for them, or as them, and rose again. Henceforth, hallelujah, know we no man after the flesh anymore. I mean, basically what he's saying this is that if, if, if we all died in Christ, and now the truth is we don't have to live as ourselves anymore. We can now live as him. He says, now we don't look at, now notice he doesn't say, and I don't look at any believer. He says, I look at no man after the flesh. Or another translation says, the outward appearance. See, one of the things that, that will happen when you understand the finished work of the cross, it will change the way you view other people. You will start to look at other people, and I'm, I'm not talking about other Christians. You would look at other people, and you would look at them and see on the outside, but discern them about what's true about them on the inside. you'll start to look at people and have compassion upon them because you say, I know something about you that you might not know. I know what God has already done for you. Amen. Come on now. Amen. So he says, I, uh, henceforth, uh, do not look at e or, or discern or judge any man after the outward appearance. Uh, he says, wherefore, Henceforth, know we no man after the outward of the flesh. He says, Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now, henceforth, know we him no more. <laughs> the, the, I think it's the, the Moffat translation says, it says, We judged him after the flesh, but boy, what a mistake we made. Amen. What a mistake we made. Verse 16. Um, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, he says, how many of you, you know that you're in Christ? I mean, I mean we've just seen that, right? And, and, and as a believer, you know you're in Christ. You've believed that. You've received Christ as your Lord and Savior. So you're in Christ. You're a new creation. And, and, and the old things have passed away. Behold, everything about you is new. Verse uh, 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 18 says, And all these things are of God, who hath reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling all believers. Oh, oh, he has already reconciled the world. See, you know something about people that they might not know. <laughs> Come on now. You already know something here. He's telling you something. You see, people are living their lives as if, as if God is their enemy. But you know that God has already reconciled them. See, we preach the gospel like this. We preach the gospel, say that come and receive Christ so that you can be reconciled. No, you have already been reconciled. Whether you believe this or not, you have been reconciled. Now, that's why Paul then goes, now listen to what he says here. He says, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not, how did he do it? Not imputing their trespasses against them, um, uh, but, but has committed to us this word of reconciliation. Now, this is the part that most Christians just mess up all the time. I did, I did this for many years. He says, now we are ambassadors for Christ. Oh, I'm an ambassador for Christ. Hallelujah. You know, it's like, oh. Paul is just saying, listen, I'm telling you all of this now as a representative of Christ. What's he saying? He says, as an ambassador for Christ, as though God beseeching you through us or by us. Hallelujah. Make your reconciliation with him. 
Okay, so I want to show you the, the, the J.B. Phillips translation puts it like this. I don't have time to go and look it up in the J.B. Phillips translation. But the J.B. Phillips translation says this. It says, God has made his peace with you. Now you make your peace with him. Hallelujah. You see, we've got to understand Jesus came and Jesus did everything necessary to produce the result of peace between you and God. And he sat down at the right hand of God. Romans chapter 8. What a, I mean, we can just turn there quickly too. Romans chapter 8. How are we doing here for time? Let's go there quickly. We can do this. Romans 8. We know this, this passage of Scripture very well. Are you guys doing all right? They're usually quiet like this? Good. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to read from verse 28. He says, <clears throat> and we know that all things. So Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things worketh together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to the, His purpose, for whom He did foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He did predestine, them He also called. And whom He called, them He also justified. And whom He justified, them He also glorified. Basically, He comes and He says, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Isn't that, isn't that I mean, he, the conclusion is, listen guys, if we can understand this, if God is for you, then who, or let me put it, what can be against you? Amen? Now, let's read the next part, because the next part is, is really very important. He says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect. Oh, sorry, verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Now, in the, in, in the, in the King James, there's a question mark there. You see it? Who shall lay a charge against God's elect? Question mark. Now, if you know anything about Greek, the Greek language, the Greek language doesn't have question marks. It really doesn't even have punctuations. So the question mark has been put there by the translators. So can I suggest something to you here? I'm, and this is my suggestion. Now you can take it or leave it, okay? I don't believe that there needs to be a question mark right there. Because if you read it in the original Greek, it goes like this. Who shall lay a charge against the elect of God? God? Question mark. The question here is this. Who is going to lay a charge against you? Will God be the one to lay a charge against you? No, he's the one who justifies you. Oh, come on now. Hallelujah. So what's he saying? He brings us to the realization. Hey, listen, if God is for you, people come to me all the time. Well, I'm not sure if God is for me. Okay, well, let's just pretend he is. <laughs> let's, just, God, let's pretend he is. If you think that God is not for you, he that spared not his own son and delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also freely give us all things? Then, he, then, then the next thing, will God be the one to lay a charge against you? No! He's the one who justifies you. Why would he be the one to lay a charge against you? Next question. Who is he that condemneth? Question mark. I would suggest to you that it should be like this. Who is he that condemneth? Christ? No, he is the one. He said, I like this. Uh, Christ that died for you? He's the one who died. Yeah, rather, he says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Rather, he's the one who is resurrected. Hallelujah. Amen. He's the one uh, he didn't just die for you. He's the one who is, uh, wait with that verse now. Uh, who is he that condemneth? Christ 
that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who is making intercession for you. Who shall separate us? Then he comes, he says, who, should, who, who shall separate us? Who shall separate us? What shall separate us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation. Okay, so this now here's, we're talking about peace. He said, if you're going through tribulation, is that a sign that God is accusing you? That Jesus is condemning you? The tribulation, is it a sign that he doesn't love you? No. See, if you're established in this, he says, who shall separate us from the love of God or the love of Christ? Shall tribulation. He now starts to mention everything he himself went through as a believer, as the apostle of God. He says, shall tribulation uh, or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, as it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are as accounted as sheep for the slaughter. He says, knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am, there it is, I am. Ah. The key here is, for I am persuaded. See, the moment you say, I am persuaded, it means there has been a time when you are not persuaded. And Paul says, you need to become persuaded. He says, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Now think about this. Things present. Would you say that the sins or the, the, the struggles that you go through, the moral struggles you go through in life, would you call that present? Would you call it a thing? He says, things present. The sins you struggle with right now cannot separate you from the love of God. Hallelujah. Things to come. The sins you, you will still struggle with can separate, can, can't separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. You see, do you see here that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father and he sits in that position of total peace with God as a man, representing you as you. Amen. Total peace. And that's your, your heritage, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this, this session with this. Verse 27 says, and, and this is going back to, to uh, John 14, verses 25, 26. Now verse 27 says, Peace I leave with you. He says, the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going he's to teach you everything that I've come to communicate to, to you. And if he communicates this to you, peace I leave with you. My peace I now give. The Amplified says, I bequeath to you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. For, he says, do not let your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Stop allowing yourselves to be agitated and disturbed. And do not permit yourself to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and unsettled. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, the peace of God is your legacy. It's given to you. It's, it's bequeathed to you. You know what? We'll, I, I, we'll pick this up in, in, the, in the session after lunch. We will pick it up here. Is that okay with you guys? Amen. All right. Good.
Awesome. Hallelujah. Where are we? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Got to get back to where we ended off. Where was that? Yeah, I know, but my notes on my iPad seems to jump. When I switch it off, it goes to another place. Amen. Oh, yeah, that's right. The legacy of peace. So we, we uh, established in the, the last um, uh, lesson that together that peace is a legacy or an, our inheritance, right? And so we established that Jesus said, he said, peace I leave with you. Peace. When, when we will allow the Holy Spirit to teach us, to show us what Jesus has come to do, to reveal to us the completed work, the finished work of the cross, then, then he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I now give. That word give me is to bequeath to you. You know, <clears throat> one of the things I'd like to just kind of add to what I taught on in the, in the last session is uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 1 and verse um, uh, 8 and 9. Now, it, let me, I, I'll, I'll read it out of uh, different translations here. Um, we saw that, that Jesus uh, came, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us that, that what Jesus came to do, He died, died for us, He died as us, uh, we died in Him, uh, that we don't have to live uh, uh, unto ourselves or as ourselves, but as Him, um, that we can live in that, in that place of, of understanding that in Christ we have been reconciled to God. We've been given this message of reconciliation. Now, um, what's important for us to know is that this is something that is guaranteed, the peace of God is guaranteed for you. How many of you like guarantees? You know, when I buy an appliance or a car or something, like that, I, I like guarantees. And uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and verses 8 and 9, the, the King James Bible, and let's see if I can get this also here in the, the Amplified version. And I like, I like the Amplified uh, a lot in this particular passage of Scripture. Um, now, in the King James, it goes, it says, um, well, let's read from verse, verse 4. He says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by Him in all utterance and in all knowledge even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8 says, Who shall also confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, you know, of course, I read that first part just so that we know that who He's talking about. So verse 8 says that, that Jesus shall also, uh, and the, 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 the old King James says, confirm you. Listen to what the Amplified says. The Amplified says, and he will establish you to the end. Isn't it powerful? He will establish you to the end. That means he will keep you steadfast. Uh, he will strengthen you and guarantee your vindication. Hallelujah. He will guarantee your vindication. I love that. So Jesus is the one, he's the one as we saw in, in the previous uh, 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 time that we were together, previous 
lesson that we did together, we saw in 2 Corinthians there that Jesus, uh, I mean, if God before us, who can be against us? God is not the one who is going to lay a charge against us. Jesus does, is not the one who's going to condemn us because Jesus has already established. He's done everything necessary to produce the peace that, that we need. We saw in Romans chapter 8 that, um, that Paul says, you know, who's going to separate us from, from the love of Christ, which is in Christ, the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus? Nothing can separate us. Well, this passage of Scripture says, but that Jesus guarantees your vindication. Now, I love this. It's not, it is unto the end. Now, the Amplified goes on. He says, He guarantees your vindication. He will be your warrant against all accusation <laughs> or indictment so that you will be guiltless and irreproachable on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Man, that's powerful. You know, I like, uh, the, the, how many of you are familiar with the old uh, living Bible? The Old Living, is a, it's, it's one of the first paraphrases that ever came out. And, uh, you know, uh, Tyndale Press put that out. And I love the way it's put in, in there. It says, we need, ha uh, sorry, that's not, that's not the verse. That, that um, Jesus is the one who guarantees right up to the end that you will be counted free from sin and guilt on that day when he returns. Man, that's powerful. So, you see, the peace of God is guaranteed to you and I. Jesus is the one who leaves us with the understanding. And he says, if you understand what I've come to communicate to you, and you will allow the Holy Spirit to teach you what I've come to communicate to you, he says, then peace I leave with you. Uh, my peace I bequeath unto you. And now notice what he says, not like the world gives. It's not the peace of this world. See, natural worldly peace is based upon the absence of war, the absence of tribulation, the absence uh, of conflict. See, worldly peace is totally dependent upon circumstances. But the peace of God is totally dependent upon the finished work of Jesus. Amen. It's not dependent upon the, the, the absence of, 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 of danger, for instance. So that means that the peace of God, the peace that the Bible speaks about, is the peace of Jesus Christ, which He bequeaths to us. And it is a peace that is a heart condition. It's, it's not the circumstances of our lives. And so, you know, Jesus, so Jesus' peace is a peace that you can depend upon. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. How many of you know that Jesus, in His life, and even in and through what He went through, He lived in the peace of God? But I want you to see that how Jesus could deal with circumstances and situations and still be in, in peace. Turn with me in your Bibles and let's go to John chapter 13. The Gospel of John chapter 13. You guys getting something out of this? Hallelujah. And I'm going to just read there from verse 1. John 13 verse 1, it says, Now before the feast of the, the, the Passover, when Jesus knew that... His hour was come that he should depart out of the world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in this, in this world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father has given uh, hath given all things unto his hand, and that he was come from God and went to God. 
He raises up, raises up from supper and laid down his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Now, there's, an, there's a really powerful uh, demonstration of what it means to live in the peace of God. Here's Jesus, and the scripture says very clearly that he knows now that right now his time has come. And we know what that refers to, that his time to die on that cross has come. Knowing that he comes from God and he's going to go be with God, amen, he, and, and, and now knowing that the devil has already put into the heart of one of his closest disciples to betray him, knowing that he's going to die the way that he dies on the cross. Now, can you put yourself in Jesus' shoes just for a minute? If, if, if what I've just read there was true about you right now, if you were sitting here right now, and you know that within a couple of hours, your time has come. And not just that you're going to die, but you know how you're going to die. And you know that your, some of your closest friends have gone and betrayed you. I don't know about you. <laughs> But if that's me, I would not be wanting to wash other people's feet. I would be saying, you need to wash my feet. <laughs> Amen. You see, but I want to show you something here about Jesus. Jesus, in the midst of his most, most his toughest time, being betrayed, knowing how he's going to die, knowing that this is going to happen, was still able to think of others Amen. above himself. Man, that's powerful. See, Jesus could be in the midst of a, of a turmoil in his life, but still think clearly. That's what it means to be in the peace of God. Amen. So let, allow the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you every day to show you. And you know what you're going to find? You know, I've been preaching, I've been preaching this, this gospel of God's love, this gospel of God's mercy, this gospel. I've been teaching for 28 years, 29 years. And I still, on a daily basis, discover the depths of this truth that I hadn't seen before. And if we will allow the Holy Spirit to constantly uh, uh, teach us what Jesus came to give us. Now notice what he says. Then he says, let not your heart be troubled. Ah, see, he's not saying your heart won't be troubled. He says you're going to, when you know the truth, you won't let your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled and, and afraid. Again, number two, do not allow yourself. Oh, you're going to have opportunities. You're going to have every opportunity in this world. All you've got to do is put on the news. And you will have the opportunity, but don't allow yourself to be agitated. Number three, do not permit yourself. You know, you can get, don't permit yourself to be fearful. Uh, and the, and they says, and the and the peace of God will fill your heart. But you see, this is again what, what we read right in the beginning, where he says you you need to seek after. Go after. Don't allow these things to 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 trouble you. You know, <clears throat> I was again. I was listening to somebody uh, talking about um, 
the, the, the phenomena of belief and what belief does. And, and boy, I tell you, this, this guy that I was listening to is a, um, he's a professor uh, in, uh, in, I can't remember what, what they called it, biological, he studies cells. And he was talking about how that um, they are now discovering, and, and this is interesting what he said. He said, uh, we have all been, in the last 50 years, we have all been led to believe that we are who we are and what we are because of our, our uh, uh, the genome, our genes, right? Uh, uh, what, what, what's, what is the other term for that? I'm trying to... The DNA, your DNA. Now, th I mean, this guy is a, he is a research professor in the realm of studying cells and studying your, the DNA. And he says, basically, we've all, all of medical science, really, has been saying that your DNA pretty much predicts who you are, what you are, and what you'll become. And he says, now, in the last 10 years, they are discovering that that's not true. That's interesting. And he was saying this. He was saying, your, your, your DNA does not determine who you are, what you are, and what you'll become. <laughs> now, you know, I'm not qualified to talk his talk, but basically what he was saying is this, is that uh, if you take the nucleus out of a cell, now in, in, in most uh, uh, scientific um, terms or biological terms, they say the, the, the brain of a cell is the nucleus. He says, but what they're now discovering is that you can take the nucleus out of a cell and the cell will still live. You know, if I, if, if I take your brain out of your body, you die. You're dead. He says, now, it will still live and it will still do and still function exactly the way it's supposed to function. It will, it will die down the line because in the nucleus is where the DNA is. He says, it's basically just a blueprint. But the blueprint does not control you. Man, that's interesting. And th this is what he said. He said, what we have discovered, though, is that your DNA can react to outward circumstances. And he's talking biologically. And basically what he says is, is we discovered that the human being has out, outward, you know, circumstances, situations, um, uh, you know, stuff that, that interact with us. And he says, our perception, oh man, this is, he says, our perception of what's going on determines how our DNA will respond. And basically what he's saying is this, and he uses the, 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 the thing, he says, and he's got all these different color glasses that he gives the audience, and he says, so if you look at a certain, like he's got a slide up there, and he says, and of course they've made it, like if you look at it through an amber lens, then you see one thing, but if you put another lens on, you see something totally different. And he says, yet you're looking at the same thing, but the filter through which you're looking determines what you believe you see. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm telling you all of that to say this. Basically, he comes down to this. He says, what you believe absolutely determines what you become what you are. And, he said, and, and of course, he goes through all of these scientific, which I, I'm not qualified to even talk about, but, and shows that, and he, call, you know, he talks about the, the anatomy of belief. 
He says, what you believe in your heart will be the outcome of your life. Man. I tell you something, that is powerful. I mean, and, and he, he, you know, basically, uh, you know, shows you through medical, medical papers and medical things that, that scientifically proving that your, your belief determines your perception, your perception determines your reality. Man. You see, when we will allow the Holy Spirit to show us what God has already done for us and who you already are and you persuade your heart in that truth then you become what you your dna your body will respond your cells will respond to your perception and belief man you know then you understand when jesus said that all things are possible to them who believe amen praise god see jesus gave us uh the prom the a promise to the world and 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 this is the promise that jesus gave how many of you like jesus's promises you like his promises all right there, here's a promise this is a promise that jesus gave us in john 16 verse 33 he says i have told you these things now listen to me i've told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence in this world, you will have tribulations, trials, distress, fr frustration. That's a promise of Jesus. I know that's not a promise you find on bumper stickers. Amen. But he says that in this world, you're going to live in this world. You're going to have tribulation. You're going to have trials, distress, frustration. He says, but I'm telling you this so that, that you may have peace. Now, you know, I've, I've, years ago, I used to look at the thing, Jesus, how, how can you promise me that in this world I'm going to have tribulation, trials, distress, frustration, and you're telling me this so that I have peace? He says, but be of good cheer. He says, it's true. In this world, you're going to have all kinds of stuff coming against you. You're going to have trials. You're going to have tribulation. You're going to have distress. You're going to have things go wrong. We live in a world that's falling apart. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> but he says be of good cheer i have uh, take courage be confident certain undaunted for i have overcome the world i have deprived it of the power to harm you and i have conquered it for you yeah. hallelujah so he's very clearly saying that that we're going to have troubles we're going to have uh, problems but you can be in the midst of tribulation and still be able to think clearly. I don't know about you, but, you know, I, I've known in years gone by, and, I'm, and you know, I'm not there yet. I, you know, I teach these things, and I say, I'm not, do I have all of this working in my life? No, I don't have it all, all figured out. But I'm, I, at least I have left, <laughs> and I'm on my way. You know, I'm, I'm going towards this. But you know what? I know how many times I've been in times of trouble, of distress, and then I can't, I can't think clearly. But you know, the peace of God, when we will allow the peace of God through the finished work of Jesus to establish in our heart, we, start to, we can be in the midst of that and think clearly. We can, we can still be able to make correct decisions. And that's what I want, to make because, you know, do you realize that the outcome of your life is very much dis decided upon the deci what you believe and the decisions you make? From You make decisions that determines where you're going to go. Amen? To, to do, make good decisions. You can still be able to treat people. This is what I love. You can be in a time of trouble, but be at peace and still treat people people with dignity and worth <laughs> don't know about you but there's been times in my life where i'm in trouble and i'm being pressed from every side and then you come along and i'll bite your head off it's like <laughs> you know what i'm saying no but you see jesus could still treat people and and serve people you will be able to to see the needs of others 
See, when you become stressful without the peace of God, you only see the need, your need. Amen. You know, uh, there's a quote that I, that I heard. Uh, how many, I know that, you know, most of you might, might not be. I love movies. I, I watch movies. I like movies. Amen. Amen. <laughs> three of you, three of you, the three of you that agreed with me here. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about. And, and in, in a movie, how many of you know that God can speak to you through anything, right? And, and this movie, uh, After Earth, anybody ever watch that movie with Will Smith? And, and, and Will Smith made this statement. And when he made this statement, I said, I have to write that statement down. This is what he said. He said, fear is real. The only place that fear, uh, yeah, the only place that fear can exist is in our thoughts of the future. It is a product of our imagination, our imagination causing us to fear things that do not at present or may never exist. That is near insanity. He says, do, do not misunderstand me. Danger is real, but fear is a choice. And you know, when I read that, I thought to myself, boy, that is so true, isn't it? That, 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 that uh, you know, we, we live in turmoil and most of our fears and our stress that we live in is because of something that only exists in our thinking. And it's not, it's not even happening. And yet we, we lose sleep about it. See, so many people think that, that, that peace can come through possessions. And I'd like to kind of end off with this here. If I can just have everything that I need, that I, if I can just have the possessions, if I just can have, you know, uh, the, the house, and if I can just have the money in the bank, if, that, that, that's going to be the, the place of my peace. Uh, let's go see what Jesus said about this. Matthew chapter 6 and verse uh, 24 um, and I'm going to read through to verse 34, but I'm going to I'm going to read from the the Message Bible. Is that okay? The Message Bible. Um, I, I like the Message Bible because it really just puts it into to our modern day English and the way that it goes. So this is what Jesus says here, verse 24. He says, "You can't worship two gods at once. Love one god, you'll end up hating." the other. Adoration of one feeds contempt for the other. You can't worship God and money both, or possessions, money or possessions. He says, if you decide for God, living a God, a life of God worship, it follows that you don't fuss about what is on the table at meal times. Or uh, 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 um, whether the clothes in your closet are in fashion, there is uh, far more to your life than the food you put in your stomach, more to you, your outer appearance, than the clothes you hang on your body. Now, let me just stop there for a moment and say this. I, I, I see Jesus coming here and he's saying, He's saying, you know, you look, at, you look at all of this outward stuff that you can have. He says that the answer to freedom from fear and stress and worry is to know your value to God. Because no, notice what he says here. He says, Look at the birds. I like what the, 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 the message says. Free and unfettered, not tied down to a job title. <laughs> not tied down to a job title. And again, like I said, you know, so many of us, we, we, we live our whole lives and we are tied down to a job title. And my job title gives me my identity and my worth. He says, he says look at the, the birds, free, unfettered, not tied down by a job title, careless in the care of God. And you count 
far more to him than birds. Amen? Can we go a little bit further? He says, Has anyone by fussing in front of the mirror even uh, gotten taller by so much as an inch? <laughs> he says, All this time and money wasted on fashion, do you think it makes uh, that much difference? Instead of looking at the fashions, walk out, and I love this, walk out into the fields and look at the wild, now they, I like this, yes, the wild flowers. I don't know if you have the same, but in, in South Africa, there's a certain part of South Africa that's it's, uh, called the Karoo, and the Karoo is like a semi-desert area. But every spring, People come from all over the world to come and witness the phenomena that happens in this dry, desolate place. Because at the beginning of spring, all of a sudden, the whole Karoo just blossoms in wild flowers for hundreds of thousands of miles just a carpet of some of the most spectacular wild flowers that just come. Now, I like the way he puts it here. He says, he says, they never primp or shop, but have you ever seen color and design quite like it? The 10 best uh, uh, dressed men and women in the country look shabby alongside them. The next verse 30 says, If God gives such attention to the appearance of wild flowers, most of which are never seen. I don't know if you got that. He says, If God will give such attention to the wild flowers, and most of it will never ever be seen by anybody. Don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, do his best for you? He says, what I'm trying to, I like this, what I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax. <laughs> Jesus basically said, what I'm trying to get you to do is stop worrying. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't allow yourself to be overtaken by fear. Amen. He says, I'm trying to get you to relax. To not be so preoccupied with getting so that you can't respond to God's giving. Did you get that? You become so preoccupied with getting that you can't respond to His giving. Hallelujah. Man, that's powerful. Amen. And then he says, people who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things. But you know both God and how he works. Steep your life in God reality, God uh, initiative, God provision. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. You know, I tell you what, I know that this ministers to you as much as it ministers to me, but do you really realize that as much as we agree with what he's saying there, that most of us don't believe it? Most of us struggle to, to, release, to release that to God. Because we are afraid that if, what, what Jesus is basically saying here is, is let go. Let Let go. But, but, but what if I do and, and he doesn't come through? Come on now. Amen. What, if, what if I just let go and I don't worry about these things? <laughs> well, he just said, you know, when you stand in front of a mirror and you worry about your appearance, did you, were you able to grow another inch? So even worrying is not going to do anything about it. Amen. 
Uh, verse 34 says, Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now and don't get worked up about uh, what may or may not happen tomorrow. I'm going to read that again. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. <laughs> See, all of us have learned in our, in our little world that we live in, you better worry about tomorrow. Amen? But he's saying, he's <laughs> saying let go of this. He says, God will keep you and deal with you with what, whatever hard times come up when the time comes. You know, I tell you, uh, Kath, my wife and I, we, we've seen this so many times now. And just recently, we've had, you know, circumstances, situations in our, in our lives and in, in our ministry. And in our ministry is life and our life is ministry. And so we've had certain things come up in, and, and uh, as far as provision and stuff like that is concerned. And, you know, bo both Kathy and I looked at this and said, oh my gosh, you know, this is, this, this is really terrible. And I mean, I was like one, one night, I'm like, I can't sleep, you know. And then my wife came to me the next day and she said, and, she, and she's always done this. And she sits down and she says, you know, Arthur, in 36 years of ministry, we have never seen God forsake us. We've gone through this before. And before I knew it, I realized, again, what I was doing is I was worrying about what could happen. And the peace of God was gone. What could happen? And it was an amazing thing. Within a week, things transpired in our ministry that the provisions that we were had, that we had, that we lost, somebody else came along from another side and took care of a double. You know. But I tell you, it's it's a hard thing to just let this go. See. Peace must become the ruling factor in our lives. To start to rule within your heart and mind. Listen to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 14 and 15. It says, uh, Paul says, Above all these, put, put on love uh, and unfold yourselves with the bond of perfectness. This is the Amplified. Which, uh, which uh, binds together everything together completely in ideal harmony and the peace of God, the soul harmony, which comes from Christ rule as an umpire continually in your, in your hearts, deciding and settling with finality all questions that arise in your minds and the peaceful, in this peaceful state to which as members of Christ's one body, you were also called, hallelujah, to live. So peace is a calling. You've been called to live in peace. And basically he's just saying, he's saying that everything in our lives needs to be the decisions we make. The umpire of peace in our hearts needs to be the, the place where we make the des decisions from which we make the decisions. The peace of God is all about knowing and believing that God is what He is, who He is, what He has done, and, and everything that is accomplished through the finished work of Jesus. Amen? Isaiah 26 and verse 3 says, You will guard Him and keep Him in perfect peace, and const, a constant peace whose mind, both its inclination and character, is stayed on you. Why? Because he commits himself to you, learn, leans on you, and hopes confidently in you. Isn't it powerful? Amen. Man, I, you know, there's, there's so much more that we can talk about here. The gospel, and I would like to just end with this and just tell you that, that there's only one source of peace. 
There's only one source of peace. If you, if you find yourself in a place of turmoil, in a place of worry, a place of stress, then go back and, and just start rehearsing the gospel of peace. The gospel is the only source of peace. When you start to look at the gospel, when you start to see the gospel, when you start to, you know, even speak the gospel over your life, then that's where peace will come from. Peace does not come from any other source but the gospel of peace. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Did you learn something? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you so much. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this wonderful time and opportunity that we could be together. And thank you, Lord, that your peace is our inheritance. Jesus, you, you came and did everything necessary. You produced the results needed that we might live and abide in the peace of God that passes our understanding, that goes beyond our reasoning. Father, we just thank you that right now that through the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord, you will establish your people in righteousness. Even as Isaiah said, Father, that righteousness, the result of righteousness is peace. So, Father, we just thank you that as we we uh, abandon ourselves to the finished work of Jesus. And we don't allow our hearts to become troubled. But know, Father, that we not only belong to you, but that you value us more than the birds, more than the wild flowers, which you so abundantly provide for. And because we know how much you love us and how much you care for us and how much you have uh, already done for us through your son Jesus, we can abandon ourselves to the peace that comes in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, that we can live daily in the joy of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.